Hello, welcome back to the tavern. Today we are talking about something that uh, I think uh, the Reddit post will give it away, but uh, is something uh, interesting that I wanted to cover in whole and not cheapen my uh, shot at it. But um, I also wanted to take a different stance on the Matt Mercer effect, as it's been, uh, I mean, I guess infamously called uh, to the, uh, the bane of Matthew Mercer himself. Um, I think the Matthew Mercer effect is, uh, it, it, in its core, is a human element to the game of Dungeons & Dragons. There are very good things that can come out of this Matthew Mercer effect, and I'm going to cover them as I go through. But there's also th some bad tied into that. Um, there's nothing perfect that's going to be granted by uh, this massive stream of Critical Role and the massive fan base it has acquired over 128-something episodes, 130 episodes of Campaign 1, and then uh, I think we're on 113 episodes of Campaign 2, each one being a minimum of about three hours long, and all of the other content that they produce. There's the uh, talks mocking the... Uh, sort of coffee table show, there's uh, narrative telephone, there, there's so much content that the critical that falls underneath this critical role umbrella that people can get sucked into and absorb and enjoy and love. And uh, I, I've been watching through all the other videos that popped up uh, back when this post was originally made on Reddit. Uh, there is, I believe, uh, David Chappie made a big video on it, um, re-watching that. Uh, Taking 20 did a whole big spiel on it. Uh, Nerdarchy took the stance of uh, we shouldn't be calling it the Matthew Mercer effect. We should be calling it the pro GM effect. But that doesn't, I, I think it's a noble sentiment, but I don't think that will work because it doesn't have the name recognition. People know it be, of the Matthew, Matthew, Mercer, Matthew Mercer effect because people get the effect most commonly tied to critical role. So... Let me cover the negatives that people have about this. And the Reddit post does a fantastic job of summing it up. Um, they're running a campaign for a bunch of first-timer first -timer problems. Speak up needs to be railroaded. Um, neutral good being uh, chaotic. Chaotic being evil. Normal stuff. Uh, one player looks like they're leaning towards murder, murder hobo. Um, and a third of my group, I'm quoting, uh, a third of my group got interested in D&D because of Critical Role. I like Matt Mercer as much as the next guy, but these guys watched 30 plus hours, so I'm guessing it's more than one at that point, but 30 plus hours of the show, it's like 10 episodes, um, maybe 8 episodes, uh, before they ever picked up a D20, the dwarf, uh, the dwarf thinks that all dwarves have Irish accents, and the Dragonborn sounds exactly like the one from the show, which is fine, and I agree with this, it's totally fine, if they are playing a dwarf and they want to have uh, a Gaelic, a Gaelic accent, Fantastic. Uh, pick an Irish accent. Pick a. You could throw Scottish in there, Northern Irish, Southern Irish. Um, like, whatever. F sure, go for it. You have a first time player that is wanting to throw an accent on their character. That's a fantastic thing. That person is immediately breaking the mold of role, ar role play when they sit down at that, that table. I know for me, it's that mental switch. Um, as soon as I jump into uh, one of my character's accents, especially when I rarely get to play a player character, I'm now th I'm now acting as that character. I'm not acting as me. I'm acting as... Uh, I have a Mark of Healing Halfling right now that talks in a southern drawl, and it's a lot of fun to play, but uh, if I'm not speaking in the way that I think Hal would speak, he... I, I don't... He, Hal, I don't make decisions for Hal in the way that I think Hal would actually make decisions. Um, it, it's that easy switch in your brain to just throw an accent on a character and it changes how you can easily think and act because language is so tied to how we think about things. We think in languages, we write in language. Um, so having that little bit of a shift can help, especially new players I found, get a feel for a different character. It's the same reason that I do accents when I DM most of the time for all of my notable NPCs. Um, I do like a, a, a Black Panther style um, uh, accent for 
uh, or, um, uh, one of my characters out of Cholt. Uh, I do uh, a one of my southern drawl accents for an NPC that I keep in Waterdeep all the time. For, it was uh, actually one of my pl- my characters. Um, didn't have the accent when I played him as a character, with more Brit style accent, but uh, it it's a recognizable character. As soon as my players will walk up to that uh, individual, now all of a sudden they have an immediate feel for who this is, not just my description of what they look like, because that can be forgotten. But the interaction that they have with that NPC and the way that they sound, the way that they talk, the way that they treat the players is what's going to be remembered, and. I think it speaks to that um, uh, iconography most efficiently if we take a look at, I believe it's Victor from Matthew, and we'll use Matthew Mercer because that's the theme today. Uh, I believe it's Victor uh, sells, uh, spoilers for campaign one, um, uh, sells uh, Percival the black powder while they are in um, one of the cities. Uh, And... Uh, the character has this like crazy old timer accent. Definitely, you get this feeling of this person that's been huffing too much glue, or maybe they mad as a hatter, and you get this feel of the character. But it's one of Mercer's most loved NPCs, I think, and it's the one people probably attribute uh, most uh, iconically to him. Like the scenes with that character stick in your mind so strongly because of this such unique way of speaking and because so much of D&D is uh, auditory instead of visual the more ways that you can get an audit um, build that auditory memory of a character the more notable a character is the easier it is to see your DM as playing that particular shopkeep or uh, the other those are characters that I think of is uh, Pumat Sol from Campaign 2 and um, Sean Gilmore from Campaign 1, the magic item merchants that the uh, groups, respective groups have encountered. They both have a very different way of speaking, very iconic way of speaking that has just made people love them so much. And the cast clearly tells um, they're excited, Not I don't think not just because of who the characters are, but they're excited to go see these NPCs because they have such uh, iconic individuality among them. So let's get uh, rambling a little. Let's get back to the post. Um, play uh, with they. F- it's fine until they meet NPCs that are played differently from how it's done on the show. Uh, approached by half half the group, how to handle resurrection. When I told them, decide when it got there. Matt, how Matt does it. WhatsApp is whole filled with geek and sundry videos about how to play RPGs better. Um, nothing wrong with how they do on the show, but he's the, this person making the post is not Matt Mercer, and they're not Ma- Vox Machina. Uh, at some point, the unrealistic expectation is going to clash with reality. How do you guys deal with players who've had past DMs they swear by? And I think that's the real meat of the issue here. It's not Matthew Mercer himself. It's the fact that some players have had that once-in-a-lifetime dungeon master or that their style and the player style fit perfectly and they loved what the dungeon master did and how they incorporated story elements from this and that or how they ran their table um, or anything that the player absolutely loved. Now that's the standard that they're measuring all of the dungeon masters that they have by. Now people have this glimpse into another game with someone who is not their dungeon master but then now they get to use that dungeon master, Matthew Mercer in this case, as a uh, rule stick to measure their current dungeon masters by or their current games by. Um, I'm not saying that's how the players will view it. I'm saying that is how I think this situation gets um, uh, too convoluted. I think at the end of the day, I would be excited to have all new players that um, got into the show, never picked it, picked up a D20, whether we're playing in person or on Roll20 uh, vir- or some other virtual platform. Never touched a Roll uh, D20 in their life. Um, and they got into the show because they wanted to uh, play this game with everyone because they enjoyed Critical Role. 
I think that's a good thing. I mean, at the end of the day, I have people that want to play the game. They want to uh, experience the play the game with each other. They want to enjoy it. And truthfully, if they're all coming to Critical Role, I have a wealth, a true wealth of information that I can use that I immediately know my players, at least to some extent, will understand. So now I get to... If I want to, I can pull in the rules from uh, Wild Mount. I can pull in the published campaign settings that Matthew Mercer's made. I can use that stuff in my game knowing that my players are going to have this canonical lore in their heads already. They, I don't have to teach someone the gods of the Sword Coast. I can just drop my homebrew campaign um, to an unexplored continent of uh, Tal'Dorei. Uh, or Wild Mount, or Matthew Mercer's world overall. I can, or some unexplore, unexplored obscure corner, and then they can decide from there. But the, or if I'm playing Tomb of Annihilation, now I just rename Schultz and I to something else, and I rename uh, a few things. Uh, maybe uh, the Port Nyan Zaru can still be Port Nyan Zaru. Uh, the people have done the exact same thing with the city of Hamlet, uh, village of Hamlet. Uh, that's in from the Greyhawk setting. You can port Hamlet directly into any other setting or any other homebrew that you want to play, but it's a wonderful way to go about things. I think that at the end of the day, the Matthew Mercer effect, one of the best things that comes out of it is you have people that are brand new to the game that you don't have to bog down with lore. Um, people want to come and play and roleplay and have fun with their friends and Roll some dice, kill monsters, get loot, all the fun stuff that people enjoy this game so much for. And tell stories with their friends. And that's really what the, it, is, it is at the end of the day. Uh, and there was a litany of articles that came out uh, damning this Matthew Mercer effect. And I don't think it deserves the hate that it gets. Because it's now a story that people that have never even played this game before only viewed it. Now they have this shared lore, this shared storyline that um, you as a DM, we, we always steal stuff from everywhere. Truth be told, even if we don't realize we're doing it, um, what we create is influenced by what we've experienced. So now if uh, I've seen crit some of Critical Role and I understand some of it, um, and my players were heavily invested in it, let's say, uh, I can go dip into the Critical Role th um, pantheon and pull gods out of it and use them in my own campaign. I can use the exact same setting and set it uh, 500 years in the past. So none of the Critical Role events happened, but my players can still be familiar, at least in some part, with the pantheon. I just scale down the city sizes and things like that. Or maybe they're in a world before the gods. Maybe uh, they uh, it's a pre-Calamity adventure with high magic and floating cities and things like that. I'm still, I can still pull a little bit of that Critical Role lore, and that's going to have my players invested in wanting to learn this world. Maybe I don't want to handle Resurrection the same way Matthew does. Uh, maybe I say that uh, this campaign is set... Um, uh, a little bit before those rules were in, in uh, pushed on to divine magic and resurrection because but then too many people were abusing it and that's how it transitioned to how it was in Matthew Mercer's games and his uh, campaign settings there are so many different ways that this can be used positively I don't think it's as big and negative as people find it to be sure there are going to be players that are going to be upset when you're not Matthew Mercer but I think and seeing this post um, with Matthew Mercer's comment here, um, best course of action uh, from uh, RN Jesus, uh, D&D Jesus himself, have a frank conversation with them about these things. Clearly say your, that your game will feel like your game uh, and it's their responsibility to bring to the table what facets they want to see in it. Show them the post if it helps. Relax, DM's kicking ass and doing this for your enjoyment and journey. Appreciate that. Listen, build with them, and make something unique. Abandon expectations and just have fun together as friends. And I can't, couldn't agree more. It's exactly what it is. But you can get past, I think, all of the vitriol that you might experience or any of the difficulties that might come from the Matthew Mercer effect 
by having a conversation with players. But that doesn't take away any of the positives of it. You have so much that you can now draw on as things that your players understand. There's rules of the game that you don't have to explain to a player. You don't uh, what flanking is at this point. If you choose to use flanking in your game, oh, if we stay on both sides of them, we get advantage. Cool, there's tactics in combat. Sounds good. Um, with uh, Caleb in Campaign 2 playing a wizard, now we've seen a, in critical role, someone role-playing, making sure that they're researching spells and um, copying things into their spell book and things like that, showing that there is this role-play element side of it. Now, you don't have to tell your player that you have to say tell that all the time. My Bladesinger wizard, I don't... I just tell my DM, like, hey, so I spend the evening at the Majors College, and I sleep in the next morning, uh, skipping breakfast. Um, and I copy down this spell and this spell. And my DM's like, all right, sounds cool. Uh, just mark off the gold for it. I assume you paid the, the Majors College for the supplies. So it's like, all right, awesome. And that's it. That is the extent of the role play for that blade singer learning new spells and gaining extra spells because I've already role played out the side of gaining access to this mages college at half price. But having access to this uh, college, I don't have to, I don't go through the entire thing every time. And uh, spoilers uh, for campaign two: the further along we get in campaign two, Caleb uh, as our well Liam O'Brien as playing Caleb has jumped into that same field. He doesn't role play out the, uh, I'm going to go and talk with this person. Oh, do you have this spell available? Oh, sure, absolutely. How much gold? Oh, sure, here you are. Like, he doesn't, he, um, he just says, uh, I'm going to do a little bit of my homework, and that's it. And boom, done, easy. But now you have this one example of how one person plays a wizard. And it doesn't have to be the end of all, end all be all. But we all have tropes of characters. Before it was Matthew Mercer, um, it was the... Uh, Driz Duerden effects. It was the stereotypical good aligned dark elf or uh, dro. It's dro. It rhymes with the word grow. Good aligned dro wielding two swords with an animal companion. I think it is one of the primary reasons rangers uh, have a beastmaster ranger archetype in 5th edition. is because of this incredibly deep art, um, uh, uh, paragon of this character wielding two swords um having a s cool animal being stealthy being and bucking the stereotype of an evil race by being good about it but sort of being good it uh any ask any dm that dm'd through the 90s or uh the early 2000s they, they had driz clones everywhere everyone wanted to be driz duarden everyone who read the fantasy books wanted to be him or, and everyone played Driz Duard and clones. Every single player knew one of them, at least. Uh, the first, my first um, DM for 3.5, um, he was one of the guys that played a Driz Duard and clone the last time he had a PC. And I'm sure he's had people play Driz Duard and clones when he's gotten to play a game. It's okay to have these different types of characters and these paragons and uh, goals for what you want your game to be and what players want their game to be like it's just important that you have this open conversation ahead of time but i think at the end of the day that matthew mercer effect is a blessing not a curse it's a starting point for players to experience um second hand so to speak but experience second hand how some people play the game how deep lore can be even of a homebrew world um, with a very good dm designing it mind you but how how they see that lore and you could say well forgotten realms and the uh, sword coast has deep lore just as deep there's so much that you can learn and now you're not spoiling it by knowing it ahead of time because you've seen critical role we're going to play in sword coast because you don't know any of it yet it's there for you to explore and learn and now they know that worlds can be that immersive and feel that alive you just need to talk to them and understand that players have expectations and the dm has expectations and most of the time they can meet up and when they don't meet up perfectly they can mesh all right and any meshing that isn't handled you can do with a conversation or by potentially trying to find another game uh i think no D, &D is better than bad D, &D. and 
if the players aren't right uh, for each other or for the group, it's a sad thing. But sometimes it's best. People have different expectations when they sit down at the game. I don't like running beer and pretzel games. I like running uh, sort of 60% role play, 40% combat games, because that's where I love to play. And I let my players know that, like, there is role play in this game. There is story development. I will tie in backstories, things like that. I do a ton of work for games that I DM when I could just play a Monster of the Week episode and say, all right, we're, we're going to be hunting this today, and now you have to go find the Hydra and kill the Hydra. Some groups would love a game like that. I'm not that DM, and that's okay. Just like the DM that made this post isn't Matthew Mercer, and Matthew Mercer isn't any of us. He's himself. We all get to have our own games and have our own expectations. This is just one more setting that is widely publicized, that is a ton of lore and expectations uh, that can be a good thing for a DM to draw on. I've run a game that is based all on Firefly lore. I just pulled away the fact that it was space travel and made it ship travel, and now I have an entire world. I think I ran it out of Salt Marsh. Uh, I dropped Salt Marsh in there when the book came out. But you get so much cool information by just pulling from pop culture and then reflavoring it a little bit. Critical Role is just another piece of pop culture. It's like watching a professional bas basketball game and then being upset that you're not a professional basketball player. Yeah, you are not Laura Bailey um, with Jester's accent and her goofiness. You are not um, Ashley Johnson and her remarkably uh, good straight man humor. Uh, that's not a comment on sexuality. That is a comment, uh, look up Abbott and Costello straight man routine. But um, it's more of the deadpan dry humor. Um, uh, wonderful. But we aren't them and that's okay but it's nice to be able to see what these professionals can do with a game like this as something to strive towards it's an idealistic thing to me and i think i i think i've become a better dm from watching matthew mercer i he cares about his players he cares about making sure that their stories are tied into the, their thing and while I don't want my game to be exactly like Matthew Mercer's, I don't want to be Matthew Mercer. I don't want to run the same game in the same world because that's dry to me. It's trite. It's been done. I'll, not to be too hipster about it, but it's not fair for, to my players to try to make myself into a Matthew Mercer clone just as much as it's not fair for me to expect them to roleplay like their cast of Critical Role. I want them to roleplay some, I want them to enjoy it and have fun with it, but they don't have to do it the same way. It'd be wrong for me to expect that, so it's wrong for them to expect the same of me. But we both have this nice pinnacle of good examples that we can lean towards and use as a guiding light along the path of becoming better role players, better TTRPGers, and uh, better players at the game overall, better storytellers the blessings so greatly outweigh the banes here and i think that the matthew mercer effect despite its name despite um how much it sounds to break matthew mercer's heart i hope i mean maybe he'll see this maybe not i doubt he'll want to sit through a long video but uh matthew mercer if you are watching what i would say to you is uh it, it's i agree that it uh it, it's heartbreaking that um players have unrealistic expectations and i agree that uh having a conversation with your player with players is the best way but don't take offense to the matthew mercer effect don't take it as a uh, black mark on your record in any possible way it honestly the things that critical role has done for bringing new players to the game, for giving people this shared lore, this shared experience, this shared story that they can all enjoy, is so greatly outweighs any of the negatives that are going to come out of this. And the amount of agreeableness that I can see in the, any episode of Critical Role between the players or between the cast, uh, the, the characters or the cast, um, yourself included, it's... It's beautiful, and it is an example right there that if the players are, are 
any player that's watching Critical Role and has expectations of their home game based on what they've seen on Critical Role, one of those expectations is that they themselves should be an approaching the table with an agreeable attitude to talk to their DM and make understandings and build trust. And I think that is the lesson to take from this. The Matthew Mercer effect, everything else, is also an effect that shows people, especially new people that are coming to this game, you need to come to the game with trust in your DM and be able to give trust to your DM that you are going to want to be there and play the game. And if there's any issues, talk to them about it because that's the end, what it is at the end of the day. All right, I've rambled enough. I hope you all enjoyed my video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share my content to anyone you think who might enjoy my channel. If you want to support me in any way, my PayPal and Patreon links are down in the description down below. I would really appreciate anything. I love doing this. I had a abysmal day at work today and uh, came home, kissed the girlfriend, uh, gave a hug to the kids, and I wanted to really make a video. So I wanted to make a video about one of the things that I really enjoy about this game, and that's the fact that we all get this shared experience from Critical Role, and it brings new people such joy um and that's really why i like to play this game too so i'll see you next time